The Epistle of Barnabas is a longer letter, but still nothing that you should prevent you from reading it. The epistle is about 25 pages in Brannon's The Apostolic Fathers, so longer than what would you expect to find from a New Testament letter. It's named after Barnabas, but there is nowhere in the letter where Barnabas claims to be the author. The chances of it being written by the son of encouragement from the book of Acts is slim to none. My guess is that they needed someone's name to attach to this letter, so somewhere along the line, someone guessed, hey, maybe Barnabas wrote it, and his name got attached to this letter. The estimated date range in which the epistle of Barnabas was written is 70 to 135 AD, so we're talking very early in the church age, regardless of where it falls in that range. Now, this is a tough one for me to review because I didn't like it all that much in my first read through it, but then I went back and went through it a second time preparing for this review, and I was actually like, I really like this, so I'm not sure why I felt the way I did before. So my feelings are kind of jumbled about the epistle of Barnabas, and let me tell you why. Welcome to Rev Reads. If you want the courage to dive into the earliest of church writings, please subscribe to the channel in order to stay up to date with my most current reviews. Also, like and share this video with others on social media. It's such a small thing, and it goes a very long way in helping other people learn about the work of Rick Brannon in the Apostolic Fathers. So I'll start by covering what I didn't like. I feel like this letter could have used a lot more grace and mercy. It was pretty heavy on what the author would call the new law, the lifestyle that should be the characteristic for the Christian. But there isn't a whole lot of grace and mercy in the midst of those sections for those who need compassion and forgiveness in their struggle to walk the Christian walk. He definitely stokes the fires that Christians should fear God, that we need to keep his commandments or else the evil ruler will come and eject us, take us out of God's kingdom. Now, his actual instructions on how to live for Christ are better than I thought they were the first time I read through it. Uh, but again, there's not a whole lot of mercy there for the one who is struggling. It's much more a view of be afraid or we'll kick you out. It seems to me as if this author would have written the letter to the Corinthians, he would have written a very short letter to just simply say, I see all your good doing and all the problems you have and you're done. When on the other hand, it was Paul's goal to restore those sinning Christians. He also had some odd allegories in this writings when it comes to the Old Testament law. He interpreted the foods that are prohibited in the Mosaic law as people to avoid. So the rabbit is a child molester. The hyena is an adulterer. The weasel is a man who joins his mouth with an unclean woman and on. It's kind of silly, kind of dumb. He also saw the 318 men in Abraham's household as standing for Jesus carrying the cross through the use of a numerical formula where each letter represented a number, which represented a word. Uh, anyway, there's just some weird stuff in this letter. But at the same time, in the Epistle of Barnabas, there was also some really good stuff. One thing I loved was his hope in a physical future rule by Jesus Christ. He was looking forward to a restored creation. He had a definite premillennial timeline where he believed that the world was about 6,000 years old. And so Jesus was about to return at the end of the 6,000th year. And then once Jesus returned, that would bring about a restored millennial Sabbath, bring about seven years of human history. Following that would be the eighth day of creation when the new heaven and new earth would enter the picture. He also, along the same lines, he expected to see a literal singular antichrist at the end of days, which again he saw right around the corner. Also, in his references to Israel, he never equated Israel with the church. He always saw them as two distinct entities. So there are several dispensational views that are present in the epistle of Barnabas. He also likens the cross to water, which imagery that is clearly meant to picture baptism. And he equates hoping in the cross with going down into the waters of baptism. Now, it's difficult to say if going down into the waters of baptism is an illustration of placing your hope in the cross, or if you only hope in the cross once you've gone down into the waters 
of baptism. It almost reads to me as if the practice of the early church was someone places their faith in the gospel, and then that naturally and always is immediately followed by baptism. So they took the two, believing in the gospel and being baptized as a singular event. So if someone believes in Jesus, whoever led them to faith would immediately be like, okay, now it's time to get you baptized. And so they saw the two, faith and baptism, as one event. Which then makes me a little sad thinking about it at sometimes our really long delay between the two events in the church today. And this picture would actually seem to align better with what we see in Acts. That is the quick belief in Christ followed by baptism. But then we also need to remember we saw in the Didache that it required a period of fasting for a couple of days before someone was baptized. So clearly there wasn't full unity in all of these practices in the early church. Which then brings us to my favorite line in this epistle. We go down into the water, being full of sin and uncleanness, and we come up bearing fruit, the fear in the heart, and having hope on Jesus in the Spirit. And whoever eats of these things shall live forever. He means this. Whoever, he says, hears these things being spoken and believes, he shall live forever. And I just love that picture of going down into the water of baptism through our hope, through our belief in Jesus and his work. And then you go down in as someone who is just covered in filth and sin, but then you come back out of the water as someone who is made new with a new heart and you're made to live with God forever. And I think that's a really beautiful picture of what happens at regeneration after we believe in Jesus. So once you hear and believe in the gospel, you are a new person with a new life that will last forever. The epistle of Barnabas also covers the topic of rewards and inheritance for the believer. And I do think that we don't spend enough of a focus today on the subject of rewards and inheritance. So I was really happy to see it present in this letter. So while there is some weird stuff here, uh, and also he could use some more encouragement for those who are struggling, which is ironic, since this epistle goes by the name Barnabas, or son of encouragement, and the one thing I was looking for more in this letter was encouragement, but on my second look through this letter, there's actually a lot more to like than I thought there was on my first read through, so maybe this is a letter that you should try to read through a couple of times, and go through this to see how Barnabas encourages you to walk in the way of light, to be one who loves the one who made you and redeemed you, to be sincere in your heart before God and others, stay off that road of death. But I think it's time for you to read the epistle of Barnabas for yourself and let me know in the comments what you think.